What if I told you that all the shocking secrets about the true origin of humanity, evolution, our past, and perhaps our future are revealed in one single book? This book is called The Lost Book of Enki. Between its two covers are hidden the answers to eternal questions, such as who are we, where do we come from, and are we alone in the universe? These are some of the questions that have intrigued the author of this book, Zechariah Sitchin. Extracted and translated from the records of the Sumerian civilization, the Lost Book of Enki is considered not only to be a part of the lost pieces of the Bible, whose sacred texts have remained the subject of speculation for centuries, but also may provide an explanation for UFO cases that have stirred much excitement in recent decades. The first to gather all these fragmented materials in search of eternal answers is Zechariah Sitchin. According to his translated texts, before beliefs were encapsulated in religions and myths, the Anunnaki first appeared on the divine stage as a civilization that came to Earth from a distant planet called Nibiru. Their presence on our lands is evidenced not only by Sumerian records, but also by Aryan temple libraries, Egyptian, Hittite, and Canaanite myths, as well as biblical narratives. What is the reason for the Anunnaki to come here? What do they have in common with the origin of our civilization? And can we connect with the numerous cases of UFO encounters? We will find these answers and many more in this new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome! Origins and Significance of the Lost Book of Enki The researcher Sitchin was born in Baku, Azerbaijan on January the 11th, 1920. After his birth, he moved with his family to Palestine. In Israel, he worked as a journalist before moving to New York, where he wrote his books. Throughout his life, from Palestine to London and New York, Sitchin continued to study ancient languages and civilizations, visiting numerous archaeological sites worldwide. The Lost Book of Enki is based on interpretations of ancient Sumerian cuneiform tablets from the area of modern Iraq and Iran. He studied many of these tablets, showing particular interest in those that speak of the gods of Sumer, called the Anunnaki. It is presented exactly as it was conveyed by one of the leading Anunnaki. And the best way to tell it all was a first-person report by Enki himself. That he had recorded his autobiography is certain, for a long text stretching over at least 12 tablets, discovered in the library of Nippur, quotes Enki as saying, When I approached earth, there was much flooding. When I neared its green meadows, heaps and mounds were piled up, at my command. In a pure place I built my house, an appropriate name I gave it. The Sumerians, from whose records knowledge of the Anunnaki originates, settled around 3800 to 4000 BCE in the lands between the Tigris and Euphrates, present-day Iraq. Researchers claim that this culture appeared on the world stage seemingly out of nowhere, without scientifically proven pre-developmental phases. The Sumerians had their irrigation and sewage systems, modern architecture, construction culture, mastered navigation, traded with foreign lands, advanced agriculture, and a modern school system. They possessed an administrative system, specialized pharmacists and physicians. Their medical knowledge was vast. From clay tablets and models depicting organs, we understand that Sumerian physicians were trained and well-versed in various forms of treatment, therapies, and surgical interventions. Their medicine had three branches, Baltitu, therapy, Sherpa Belimti, surgery, and Erti Mashmashi, birth and confirmation. Skeletal findings in tombs indicate that they even performed brain surgeries. Patients could choose between two types of doctors, a water doctor, A.ZU, and an oil doctor, IA. Diagnosis, treatment, and therapy were based on extensive knowledge of natural medicine. As revealed by the discoveries, the Sumerians also possessed considerable knowledge of mathematics and astronomy. Sumerian mathematics was based on the sexagesimal system, with the base number 60. This ancient civilization divided the zodiac into 30 degrees in 12 signs, which we still use today. Moreover, the calculations for the circle, 360 degrees, hours, days, weeks, months, and the calendar year, 365.24 days, continue to be a part of modern calculations and timekeeping. The Greek word Gaia, or Latin Geo, meaning the goddess of the harvest, is derived from the Sumerian Ki, or Gi, the word for Earth. 
The symbolic sign is horizontal, intersected by eight vertical lines oval. The root of the word is evident in concepts like geometry, geology, and geography. Likely, the Sumerians also had extensive knowledge of the solar system. Many scholars reasonably believe that one of the cylinder seals is a star map. Cylinder seals, a Sumerian invention comparable to a printing press, are small cylinders typically made of semi-precious stones. They are about 2.5 to 7.5 centimeters long and two fingers wide. Various motifs are engraved on their surfaces. When rolled onto soft clay, they create a print, something like an ancient comic. This technique was used later by cultures in the Tigris and Euphrates region, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Akkadians. Cylindrical seals depict scenes from everyday life, mythological moments, and historical events that, according to the seals, occurred centuries and millennia before the creation of the cylinder seal. From the Sumerian cuneiform, we learn about our solar system, which has not always been as we know it today. According to the writings, there was initially a solar system with three planets, the Sun, Mercury, and Tiamat, before Earth appeared. After the emergence of the other planets, a new planet called Nibiru entered the solar system from outer space. Passing by Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn, its intrusion caused changes in the gravitational forces of the remaining planets, leading to major explosions and catastrophes, resulting in the creation of new moons. A collision occurred between Tiamat and one of Nibiru's moons. It excavated a small part of Tiamat, which was thrown into a foreign orbit, taking one of the moons along. Today, we recognize these two fragments as our planet, Earth and its moon, our satellite. The Sumerians not only excelled in their time, but also left indelible traces in the history of humanity. They were the first to record chronicles and myths that became the foundation for many cultures, from the Jewish narratives of creation and the flood to the myths of the Greeks and Hittites. Thus, Sumerian civilization remains not only one of the pillars of ancient history, but also a mysterious source of knowledge that continues to captivate scholars and researchers today. In the ruins of the Middle East, tens of thousands of clay tablets have been discovered, preserving the wealth of this ancient culture. These tablets reveal not only the daily life of the Sumerians, trades, wages, marriage contracts, but also royal chronicles and spiritual texts hidden in palace and temple libraries. Particularly interesting are the findings of clay prisms, which tell of the ten antediluvian rulers and their rule over 432,000 years, as well as the lost books or texts inscribed on stone tablets. These discoveries were exhibited at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, England, revealing that the Sumerians had access to even older, canonized texts. The most significant written testimony from Mesopotamia, however, remains the Epic of Atrahasis, well-preserved and describing the world before the Flood and the development of humanity on Earth. The epic recounts the arrival of the Anunnaki, who came around 450,000 Earth years ago from the planet Nibiru. And so begins the first chapter in the history of humanity, and in the beginning was… Gold. Arrival of the Anunnaki and their first settlement The Lost Book of Enki brings together all the valuable writings of the ancients, translated and compiled in a series by the writer and researcher Zikaria Sitchin. In it, he recounts that the millions of years after the collision of Tiamat with one of Nibiru's moons and the formation of Earth with its moon, the inhabitants of Nibiru, through their actions, disrupted the atmosphere of their own planet. Nuclear weapons led to serious cataclysms, gradually destroying life on their planet. All living things suffered from the decisions of their leaders, prompting them to seek new approaches to saving their species. At that time, the breach in the sky over Nibiru was wide open, and scientists discovered that each orbit around the Sun was tearing their atmosphere apart even more. The proposed solutions for salvation were two to detonate nuclear weapons to shake the earth and activate volcanoes, or to find gold. Lama, the ruler at that time and the eighth consecutive son of the Anshagal line, provoked the anger of all with his weak leadership and was forcefully dethroned by his father, Alalu. Alalu did not fare better in governance either. His decision to detonate nuclear weapons to move the volcanoes proved to be a massive mistake, for which the inhabitants of the planet paid dearly. 
The water and food on Nibiru became scarce. The settlers suffered from scarcity and harsh conditions. A new approach, new solutions, a new ruler, and gold were needed. Then Anu, also a descendant of the royal lineage, desired rulership over Nibiru. He had to ascend to the throne through a battle with Alalu. A new solution for their devastated atmosphere was also needed. The gold on the planet was utterly insufficient to cover the hole in the sky. After each dispersion of gold dust into the atmosphere, the gap closed, but Nibiru's approach to the sun reopened it to the same size. The planet's reserves were inadequate. Alalu, banished from his land but determined to reclaim his throne, set off for the newly formed planet, the fragment torn from Tiamat, our present home, Earth. His belief was that Ki, as it was then called by a civilization, might possess the gold they so desperately needed. This would put the Nibiruans in a dilemma, where he would be the hero, saving their planet and potentially becoming the new ruler of Nibiru. Alalu discovering gold holds Nibiru's fate in his hands. To snow-hued earth, Alalu set his course. By a secret from the beginning, he chose his destination. To regions forbidden, Alalu made his way. No one has gone there before. No one at the hammered bracelet, a crossing had attempted. A secret from the beginning, Alalu's course has determined. The fate of Nibiru in his hands, it placed by a scheme his kingship to make universal. On Nibiru, exile was certain. Their death itself he was chancing. In his scheme, risk was in the journey. Eternal glory of success was the reward. Riding like an eagle, Alalu the heaven scanned. Below Nibiru was a ball in a voidness hanging. Alluring was its figure. Its radiance emblazoned the surrounding heavens. Its measure was enormous. Its belchings, fire blazed forth. Upon arriving on Earth, Alalu encountered no intelligent beings. It was quite uninhabited, but teeming with fruitful trees, various vegetation, aquatic and amphibian inhabitants, unlike those on Nibiru. He was most astonished by the shortness of day and night on Earth. His native planet had an average orbit period around the Sun of 3,657 Earth years. Its diameter was four times larger than Earth's, and its mass was 23 times greater. However, Earth had something that was nearly depleted on Nibiru, gold. This led another 50 inhabitants from Nibiru to Earth, and thus the first earthly city and camp of the Anunnaki were established, Eridu, in Sumerian meaning mighty city. Today, we know this city as the location of Tel Abu Sharain in the Dikar province, Iraq. Leading the expedition was Ea known later as Enki, depicted today as the god of waters and mining. He was known as one of the two sons of Anu, the ruler of Nibiru. According to the writings, Enki created a habitable settlement on Earth in six days. On the first day, he separated the waters to provide drinking water. On the second day, he explored the plant life offered by the new land and designated edible ones. Thus, the Anunnaki had both food and water. On the third day, he attended to the dwellings, and the fourth was dedicated to the enclosure of the waters from the land. The fifth day involved dealing with the animals and their separation. All of this concluded on the sixth day, and on the seventh, after the long journey and diligent work, the Anunnaki took a well-deserved rest. Thus, the days unfolded, gold mining began, and the seventh day remained predetermined for rest, continuing to this day. On the seventh day, the heroes in the encampment were assembled. To them, Ea spoke these words, A hazardous journey we have undertaken, from Nibiru to the seventh planet, a dangerous way we traversed. At Earth, we with success arrived, much good we attained, an encampment we established. Let this day be a day of rest, the seventh day hereafter a day of resting, always to be. However, one Earth year later, the gold extracted from the waters near Eridu was not enough to fill the terrible gap in Nibiru's atmosphere. While the Nibiruans joyfully welcomed the meager gold that reached their planet, a new approach and a richer source were needed to save their habitat. Enlil, Anu's other son, also had a proposal to explore the depths of the Earth. He believed that the waters were not so rich in gold. But beneath the surface, the treasure they sought was hidden. 
To confirm his theory, Enlil was sent to the new planet, and shortly afterward, Anu himself arrived to make the fateful decision to leave both his sons on Earth, entrusting them with the fate of Nibiru. The expedition to Earth in search of salvation momentarily silenced the disputes over power among the Anunnaki. However, Alalu, the discoverer of Earth's treasure trove, was not pleased. The proclamation of Ea as Enki, the god of the new planet, stirred his anger, leading to a new battle. It can be said that this was the first battle on our planet, fought among the first settlers. Anu once again defeated Alalu, who, in a fit of anger, bit off a part of Anu's flesh, preventing him from producing more offspring. Thus, Alalu was sent into exile on a planet called Lamu, more familiar to us as Mars. Anzu, the pilot, accompanied him. Anzu's duty after Alalu's death was to bury him, as customary on Nibiru, and then, if he himself remained alive, to be the first commander of Lamu. The decision of the ruler Anu made through casting lots, an event on which no one could usually dispute, to withdraw and rule over his lands while his sons Enlil and Enki would reign on Earth, led to a new development on Earth, the creation of more cities. The first of these was named Eden, the abode of the righteous. In the Bible, you'll recognize it as Eden, or more commonly known as the Garden of Eden. This biblical place was marked by four rivers originating from it, presumed to be located in Iraq today, with the rivers being Tigris, Euphrates, Pishon, and Gion. The writings of the Sumerians, a subject of long-term study by author Zakaria Sitchin, provide a wealth of information depicted with remarkably few symbols. The Sumerian tablets describe the planet Nibiru as the twelfth planet and assert that they owe all their knowledge to the inhabitants of this planet, the Anunnaki. Why the twelfth? Because the ancient Sumerians, besides knowing the nine planets we recognize today in our solar system, also counted the sun and the moon, considering the planet in question, called Nibiru by them, as the twelfth in sequence. An interesting fact is that we discovered Pluto thousands of years after them, only in 1930. The story so far is described in just four of the twelve tablets, translated literally in the work The Lost Book of Enki. All the events described in these tablets and the remaining eight raise questions. Do the Sumerian writings represent lost parts of the Bible, and are the Anunnaki the gods who created humans? The Creation of the First Human the quest for gold on Earth demanded dedication and resources that, according to the Lost Book of Enki, the Anunnaki had to invest to save their own planet. The construction of cities was already underway. Enlil himself built a residence for himself north of Eridu, in the Cedar Forest, calling it the Abode of the Northern Ridge. Additional landing stations for their spacecraft were established to facilitate the transportation of gold to Nibiru. One such station was on Mars, whose land was under the rule of Anzu. For this purpose, 300 Anunnaki were sent to Lamu to maintain and manage the facilities necessary for the spacecraft. The Anunnaki refer to them as the Ajiji, the first known tribe inhabiting planet Mars. The moon was also considered a potential stopover for the Anunnaki. A long stay on our planet for the invaders was becoming apparent. It was necessary to create conditions that resembled their native Ninma, the sister of Enkian and Lil, and the daughter of the ruler Anu, was renowned for her healing skills and knowledge of plants. That's why she was tasked with bringing various seeds to Nibiru to sow them on Earth. It is presumed that wheat, grapes, and barley are among these plants, since the Anunnaki consumed a lot of wine and beer during their feasts and celebrations. Ninma, in addition to being the sister of Enlil and Enki, was also the mother of Enlil's son, Ninurta, who eagerly desired to see Earth up close and was eager to be called upon to contribute to gold mining. The arrival of more Anunnaki on our planet inspired Enlil to create more cities. The first one he built was the city of Lhasa, followed by Lagash. Both cities served for navigation and easy orientation for the incoming spacecraft from Nibiru. The next city, Shurapak, was located less than 30 kilometers away, dedicated to Ninma, and designated as a healing city. Following were the cities Abzu, located beyond the waters of Eden, and Nibruki, where they stored their Tablets of Destinies, devices used in the Flight Control Center for tracking and controlling orbits and trajectories. The construction of Lamu also thrived. 
The Anunnaki were pleased with their creations, but their work had just begun because the gold mining required incredible efforts to obtain the quantity needed to save Nibiru. The favorable conditions on Earth not only allowed the Anunnaki to settle while extracting gold, but also to create life similar to what they had on their own planet. The relationships between Enki and Ninma, and between a woman named Sardin and Leel, naturally extend to the faces of their future offspring. Ninma bore daughters to Enki after already having a son named Marduk by him. Sardin and Leel also created offspring. For the Anunnaki, this was the first generation born on a foreign planet. In total, 600 Anunnaki became settlers, finding life beyond the limits of Nibiru, 300 on Earth, and another 300 on Mars. However, their happiness did not last long. With them and Leel all comings and goings oversaw, on Earth the Anunnaki toiled of work and sustenance they were complaining. By Earth's quick cycles they were disturbed. Of the Alexa, they only small rations were given. In the Eden, the Anunnaki toiled. In the Abzu, the work was more backbreaking. By teams were Anunnaki sent back to Nibiru by teams, new ones were arriving. The Ajiji on Lamu dwelling were the loudest in complaining. When from Lamu to Earth they descend a rest place on Earth, they were demanding. With Anu did Enlil and Enki words exchange. The king they consulted. Let the leader come to Earth with Anzu having discussions. So did Anu to them say. Anzu to Earth from the heavens descended. The words of complaints to Enlil and Enki he delivered. Seeking a solution to appease their disgruntled workers, they decided to gather more Nibiruans and work in shifts. They decided to create a new city, Bad Tibira, which they called the Metal City, where they refined the precious metal. These actions, aimed at optimizing work, yielded results. The atmosphere of Nibiru slowly began to heal. Although the tension was temporarily extinguished, it continued to accumulate. The Anunnaki were not satisfied. A better solution was needed, and it was found in Abzu. Although they believed they had acquainted themselves with all beings inhabiting the heavenly corner, Enki noticed a new species living among the trees. Distinguished by its semi-erect posture and the fact that its front legs were set apart like hands, similar to the Anunnaki themselves, he observed the similarity between their kinds and this new, unstudied species of beings. The Anunnaki were considerably larger, their fur sparser than that of the unfamiliar creatures, and they were endowed with reason, enabling them to create. However, upon seeing these beings, an idea sparked in Enki's mind to create a hybrid species that would assist them with their work. This would quell the rising wave of discontent. The Anunnaki would obtain their gold without exerting so much effort, and Nibiru would be saved. The idea of creating many such workers, however, faced the moral resistance of Enlil. The Anunnaki, like all our predecessors, believed in the divine and knew that creation belonged solely to one creator. Enlil knew well that this role was not theirs. He staunchly opposed it, categorizing this act as slavery, which had long ceased to be a part of their culture. Faced with a difficult choice whether to save their own kind or create something new against the laws of nature, their decision was dictated by Anu and stated the following, Lulu would be created, the primitive worker who would deliver them from the danger of extinction. The task was assigned to Ninmar and Enki. Ninmar invested all her knowledge and used sacred formulas brought from Nibiru. It was decided that the mixtures would be prepared in a crystal vessel, and the newly discovered species would be artificially fertilized and give birth on its own. Dozens of attempts followed this decision. The first creature created lacked the ability to express itself vocally, others were paralyzed, and some were born with organ deficiencies. At each stage of the experiment, Ninma added more divine DNA into humanity until it began to resemble the Anunnaki in every aspect. Linguistic skills, learning and developmental abilities, scientific curiosity, behavior, emotions, emotional attachment, everything except immortality. Despite Enki's impressive knowledge in astronomy, physics, and engineering, he did not possess the talent in biology, medicine, and genetics that his half-sister Ninma did. The first successful attempt occurred when they changed the vessel in which the mixture was prepared, using clay made from earth materials and the womb that belonged to none other than Ninma herself. 
the first completed earthly being of male gender was born, a product of the combination between the Anunnaki and the Earthlings. You probably know his name, Adamu. The joy of the Anunnaki was immeasurable when Adamu was born. They decided that his life would not be marked by labor in obtaining gold in the name of Nibiru, but would be raised and educated in skills in Eden. His companion was the first female Lulu, born to Enki's spouse, Ninki. She named her creation Tiamat, baptized after the planet that gave life to Earth. Thus, like Ki and Kingu, the moon and Earth, Tiamat and Adamu were left to live in the Garden of Eden. Thanks to the Anunnaki women, who offered their wombs, many Lulus were born. Their task was to assist the Anunnaki in obtaining the precious metal they came for. In Eden, it was Ningashida's turn, Enki's son, better known to us as Thoth or Hermes, to carry out the third evolutionary leap in the DNA structure of Adamu and Tiamat. But this time, it was done directly on other living organisms. For this purpose, Ningashida used the DNA of Ninmar and Enki, extracted from the bone marrow taken from a rib. As a result of this controlled mutation, the pair gained intellect and the ability to reproduce, a goal long pursued by Ninmar and Enki. Adamu and Tiamat's journey to Eden was mainly aimed at showcasing the great achievement of Ninmar's creation. She copied their genomes and created seven female clones of Tiamat and seven male clones of Adamu, Fourteen goddesses, assistants to Ninmar, offered to be surrogate mothers and bear the offspring. Later, these clones were sent to work in the gold mines, as was the initial plan voted on by the Council of the Gods. Over time, however, Enki noticed that their creations, after repeated reproduction, had reverted to their primitive habits. His contribution remained in history as the creation of the first civilized people after producing offspring from two earthly women, one gave birth to a son, and the other, a daughter. Enki was proud of his creation, and together with his wife, Ninki, they raised Adapa and Titi, and the secret of their origin remained hidden for a long time. Thus, Earthlings not only resembled the Anunnaki intellectually and emotionally, but were also capable of reproducing and continuing evolution on their own. The generation of Enki was to populate Earth and, a little later, be trained to create as the Anunnaki themselves did on Earth. This story, more or less known, drawn from Sumerian tablets, describes the creation of humanity. In the Bible and the Quran, as the main religions on our planet, there are similar beliefs, if not the same. The two resemble each other more than they differ. Traditional views on the creation of humans in both religions are based on the biblical narrative of how God created first man, Adam, from the dust of the ground and in his own image and likeness, and then the first woman, Eve or Hawa, from Adam's rib, Genesis 2-7, 126, 27, 22 From the descendants of Adam and Eve, humanity originated as a biological and social species, and they are known as the progenitors. Adam and Hawa, the father and mother of humanity in Islam and the events that happened to them, are considered the first cause or precedent for all subsequent events in human history. All this leads to one thought. The source of information is likely one and the same and predates all recorded beliefs. Can we correlate the stories from the Bible, the Quran, and the cuneiform script with history? The Great Flood and Humanity Afterwards Science presents a completely different perspective. Although illogical in many ways, it entirely rejects the theory of extraterrestrial intervention in our biology and the development of our species. Despite its essence being to work with evidence, Sumerian records are not described in history textbooks, nor are their translations taken into account. However, for one event, religion, ancient records, and science reach an agreement. The Great Flood in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened, the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Genesis chapter 7 verses 11 to 12. This event is believed to have occurred around 5600 BCE, and while the evidence collected by archaeologists doesn't provide definitive details, scientists have no doubt that such a flood indeed existed. However, the Sumerian tablets provide a much more detailed account of the event. 
After creating the first civilized humans on Earth, the Anunnaki could take a break from the prolonged efforts they had put in. Gold mining proceeded at satisfactory rates, and soon they were about to return to their home planet. While for Enlil, the mission was solely that, his brother Enki had sincerely bonded with humanity. The offspring of Adapa and Titi, Cain and Abel, were taught by Nana and Marduk about agriculture and animal husbandry. Abel could pass on knowledge of raising animals, while Cain took care of sustenance from the land. Similar to the Bible, Cain kills his brother Abel out of envy. When summer began, it was not raining. The meadows were dry, the pastures dwindled. Into the fields of his brother Abel, his flocks drove from the furrows and the canals to drink water. By this, Cain was angered to move the flocks away his brother he commanded. Farmer and shepherd, brother and brother, words of accusation uttered. They spat on each other, with their fists they fought. Greatly enraged, Cain a stone picked up. With it, he Abel in the head struck. Again and again, he hit him until Abel fell, his blood from him gushing. When Kai and his brother's blood saw, Abel, Abel my brother, he shouted. Motionless on the ground did Abel remain. From him his soul had departed. By the brother whom he had killed, Kai remained for a long time. He sat crying. He is not forgiven for this act. He was banished from the lands of the Anunnaki and went on to create a generation in other parts of the earth. Adapa and Titi together raised a total of 30 sons and 30 daughters. Their last son, known as the Egyptian Seth, also created a generation, Kunin, who learned how to manipulate fire. The next generation from the lineage was trained in music. Thousands of years have passed since the creation of the first human on earth. The population multiplied, knowledge was passed down, and new skills were acquired by humanity. People learned how to track months with the moon, years with the sun, and the division of the celestial circle into twelve parts with constellations, named after the twelve great Anunnaki. According to Sumerian traditions, Adapa lived for fifteen shahs, which is fifty-four thousand earth years. Although deprived of immortality due to a collective decision by the Anunnaki, the first Earth inhabitants had significantly extended lifespans. Before his death, Adapa predicted the future calamity and the death of his own son, Cain. Enki, Enlil, and Ninma also aged. The earthly cycles altered their genome, making them appear older than Anu, their father. Time flew for everyone on the planet. Thousands of years later, gold mining was coming to an end. The trips to Nibiru and back would soon end. Earth would remain in the possession of Earthlings, trained in how to create and care for the land and their offspring. However, the Anunnaki Coven would remain accessible only to a few. Nibiru's approach to the sun brought ruin to Earth, the glaciers were melting, and the Earthling's time was numbered. The Anunnaki knew full well what was coming. One of Enki's sons named Ziu Sudra, unusual in appearance with white hair and bright blue eyes, grew up in Shurapak. In his time, the foreshadowing of the disaster to come began. The land became barren, famine and disease beset the men. It was explained to them that the wrath of Enlil was causing all the upheaval. Enlil believed that natural events and their consequences should not be influenced. Such was the destiny of mankind, and the Anunnaki had no right to interfere with it. Enki and Ninma, the mother from whose womb the first man emerged, were strongly attached to humans. Enki himself was the father of many of them. In a dream, he received a sign not to leave the descendants to their fate, but to help the earth repopulate. The flood could not be stopped, but the effects of the global catastrophe could be mitigated. Together with his sister Ninma, they set out to preserve all that had been created up to that point on a planet unknown until a few shards ago. Ninma took the genomes of all the plants and animals. They were handed by Enki to Zia Sutra. Although he had sworn an oath to his intransigent brother not to help the humans, he used his cunning and showed him the plans for exactly how to build the chest that would survive the flood. Enki believed that their mission on Earth was not only to save their own planet, but perhaps to create the human race that would populate the planet. He saw humans as more than workers and a failed experiment. That is why he insisted that the flood be recorded, so that humanity would remember this moment in its history. 
That was how the Ziasudra family and the entire Earth DNA database survived the apocalypse set up at Enlil's behest, when the astronomical catastrophe predicted by the Anunnaki scientists triggered the flood. As the flood approached, some Anunnaki decided to remain on Earth. They thought they would survive and then continue their tenure on some of the land. Although they had their choice and considered themselves powerful, many of them perished. 120 shards after the arrival of the Anunnaki on Earth, the flood overwhelmed everything they had created. For seven days, according to Sumerian writings, Ziusudra traveled uncontrollably in the boat with his family and the genomes given by Enki. Forty days after that, the rain did not stop. After the forty days Ziusudra the boat's hatch opened, his whereabouts to survey. A bright day it was, a gentle breeze was blowing, all alone, with no other sign of life, the boat upon a vast sea was lolling. Mankind, all living things, off the earth's face are wiped out. No one except us few survived, but there is no dry land to set foot upon. So did Ziasudra to his kinfolk say, as he sat down and lamented. At that time, Ninagal, by Enki appointed, the boat toward the twin peaks of Arata directed. A sail for her he shaped, Toward the Mount of Salvation, he the boat guided. Impatient Ziusudra was, birds that were on board he released, to check for dry land, for surviving vegetation to verify he sent them. He sent forth a swallow, he sent forth a raven, both to the boat returned, he sent forth a dove, with a twig from a tree to the boat it returned. Now Ziusudra knew that the dry land from under the waters had emerged. A few more days, and the boat by rocks was arrested. The deluge is over. At the Mount of Salvation we are, so did Ninagal to Ziusudra say. Opening the watertight hatch, from the boat Ziusudra emerged. The sky was clear, the sun was shining, a gentle wind was blowing. After the flood, life on Earth slowly returned. The seed saved by Ziusudra germinated in the ground. The species that survived the disaster in pairs created offspring. Ziusudra and his family repopulated the earth with their offspring. The Anunnaki in turn discovered new deposits of gold across the oceans. They came to a unanimous agreement to relive the old times and rebuild the planet. Enki, Enlil and their offspring divided up their holdings, creating dwellings once again. Water had flooded much of the land they had previously known. They needed to build new landing stations, but the old peaks were gone. To facilitate their arrival, they created artificial peaks with four points towards the Earth. On top of them, they placed special crystals that Enlil activated with his hands. We still see these peaks today in Egypt, and still ask the question, who built them? The creator of these imposing structures was Ningashida, one of the sons of Enki, later known as Thoth according to Sitchin. The Anunnaki continued their life on Earth for a long time. All the sons and daughters of Enlil and Enki and their sons and daughters made the Earth their home. Some created more offspring, others engaged in deadly battles with the Ajij, but none of them returned to Nibiru. Anu and his beloved Antu decided to visit Earth that had become home to their children. Upon their arrival, they realized the reason the Flood had not wiped humanity from the face of the planet, and though it was against their understanding, they accepted it as destiny and decided to help the Earthlings. They created four regions of Earth, the land of one, which fell to Enlil, the land of two narrows given to Enki, the land of Far, which fell to Inanna, known as Ishtar, and one left to be inhabited by the Anunnaki, the place of chariots. Before returning to Nibiru, Annie encouraged her children to bestow knowledge upon the people and then leave. With God's blessing, the first city of the people was created, Kienji, known as Suma, the land of the sublime watchers. The people had already mastered needlework and crafts, boats floated in their waters, their fields were irrigated, their sheepfolds and granaries overflowed, bliss filled the land. The Blackheads, as the Anunnaki called them, created the city of Scepter, Kishi, and this was the first city proper from which the kingship of man began. But prosperous mankind wanted more. They wanted to ascend to their gods. Marduk, dissatisfied that land had not been allotted to him, helped them create a stone tower reaching to the sky. Enlil thwarted this attempt by giving humanity different languages so that information could not travel unchecked among men. 
Finally, Marduk also received his piece of land, the land of the two narrows, Hemtar, the dark brown land located along the Nile. In Inanna's domain, however, things didn't go so smoothly. Across the seven mountain ranges, civilized humanity yet never emerged as she suffered for her lost lover and could not cope with both her possession and her grief. From her lineage was born the first son of Lugash, which was a title, Gilgamesh. He was obsessed with the idea of immortality and wished to strongly obtain the plant that made the gods of the earth immortal. He succeeded in reaching the land of chariots where the secret of eternal existence was hidden. There, by a well after many tunnels, he was met by Ziasudra, who, thanks to the secret of the Anunnaki, managed to preserve his youth. Symbolic or not, after Gilgamesh took the plant, a snake, attracted by its fragrance, snatched it away. At that time, Marduk was also seized by an obsession with greatness. Ra, as he was called on Earth, sought to conquer territories that were not destined for him. The first bloodshed in the name of power began on Earth. After peaceful times of creation and prosperity came days of terror. Calamity was foretold in one of Enlil's dreams, one such as mankind had not yet known. As in the flood, so now one must be chosen to preserve the human race. Enlil, however, told this secret to no one. Tensions among the Anunnaki grew. Hidden weapons of terror were brought out. Without much warning, the dark cloud covered the eastern lands. Much of humanity found its death. Ra received his dominion. The first region was completely destroyed. The second and third were in a woeful state, and the place of the chariots was nothing more but a memory. The Earth mission they had come with had undergone twists and turns that no one could have foreseen. The true faces of the gods described in the clay tablets do not match any other story of human history. Does history unfold in a cyclical loop, each repetition aspiring for the triumph of the divine within us? Our history, carefully hidden from us, served up in bits and pieces on white paper, does not present us with a shred of this version of creation. If you search the internet, you'll find that in this vast space there is almost nothing preserved of the Sumerians' messages. A natural need, moral and spiritual as well as psychological, urges us to discover the knowledge hidden in the books we read less and less. Science views Nibiru as a hypothesis. This hypothesis is expected to pass within about 21 million miles of Earth. It has a narrow and very elongated elliptical orbit due to the planet orbiting around two centers of gravity. The Sun and its twin, an extinct star that we cannot see and which lies at 18,724 times the distance from the Sun to Pluto. In a June 28, 1982 Newsweek article, John Anderson of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena suggested that the orbital deviations of Uranus and Neptune are due to an invisible double of the Sun, a dark star, gravitationally bound to it but billions of miles away. The planet is said to be inhabited by humanoids, which are very similar in appearance to humans, only significantly taller at between 2 and 3 meters. These humanoids have repeatedly visited Earth in the past. Moreover, they have lived here and had the behavior of colonizers. In various ancient legends, myths and tales, they are spoken of as giants. The numerous megalithic structures scattered across the globe are their handiwork. The pyramids in the face of Mars, which has become a desolate, arid planet because of the intensive mining operations they carried out there, are also their work. Contemporary perspectives acknowledge parallels between biblical narratives, creation, Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, the Flood and the Tower of Babel, and texts recorded millennia earlier. As science and theology converge on shared insights, the ancient stories embedded in human consciousness find resonance across time and space. In the archives of Mesopotamia, particularly within the historical tapestry woven by the Sumerians, there lies a profound acknowledgement. They explicitly attribute their understanding of events predating the dawn of civilizations, and even preceding the advent of humanity itself, to the writings of the Anunnaki, literalized as those who from heaven came to earth, the enigmatic deities of antiquity. According to the insights presented by Zechariah Sitchin, Nibiru, the celestial body inextricably linked to the Anunnaki, concluded its last visit in the year 556 BC. With a purported orbital cycle spanning 3,600 years, the imminent return of Nibiru is anticipated in the third millennium. 
However, he believes the Anunnaki may come earlier than expected, potentially between 2090 and 2370. Their arrival will coincide with the astrological transition from the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. Could the Anunnaki already be among us? Or perhaps, in a twist of cosmic intrigue, they have never truly departed from the Earth's sphere? Or who knows, maybe they haven't left Earth at all? Share your thoughts down in the comments, give this video a thumbs up, and watch our related videos on the screen right now. Keep your minds open, and until we meet again.